Welcome back to Real Clear Radio Hour, brought to you by the Competitive Enterprise Institute. I'm your host, Bill Fresno. Joining us for the second half of our show is Mark Levin, Policy Director of Right on Crime, as well as the Director of the Center for Effective Justice. Mark, welcome to the show. Thank you. Mark, conservatives uniformly agree that public safety is a core responsibility of government, in particular because a well-functioning criminal justice system enforces respect for every person's right to life and property. Yet it's not hard to see that many elements of a criminal justice system today are out of whack. Reform has emerged as not only a major issue in the conservative movement, but as an opportunity to reach out to like-minded reformers on the left to join the fight against the status quo. What do you see as the key elements of the problem? Well, of course, everyone realizes, as you mentioned, public safety is the core role of government. And of course, at the federal level, that takes on the military form. But at the state and local level, you're looking at police and, of course, I would say locking up the people we're afraid of, not those mm-hmm. we're mad at. And the problem is, just like other areas of government, whether it's healthcare, education, the environment, you start out with perhaps a core mission, and then there's only a one-way ratchet. You mm-hmm. only get more laws, and in many cases, stiffer penalties, longer mandatory minimums. And we end up really focusing on people that aren't a danger to society, and we end up with too many criminal laws. And frankly, a lot of times, we're actually doing more harm than good. When we put someone in prison who's not a danger, who, for sure. example, just has a drug problem, they meet worse people, and they come out a danger. Danger. So that is kind of what we're doing is focusing on how do we maximize public safety without being too tough on taxpayers. Well, then I was going to ask you that. How much do taxpayers spend on criminal justice at both the federal and state levels if you include the police, prisons, and the courts? Well, it's about $80 billion. It's a huge sum of money. And that's actually just corrections. But then you have to add police right, and courts. Yeah. It's hard to keep track of it because the police is obviously a city function. Yep. I think that what the public wants to know is we're actually spending the money wisely. And and I think that one of the things we often lose sight of is actually, are we making sure victims of crime, people that are stolen from, that they're getting restitution? That ought to be a top focus. Instead, often, we uh, in the past, we've measured our success by how many people are in prison or how much money the government is collecting. And instead, we need to focus on, are we reducing the crimes that really damage communities, those with victims? And are we making sure victims get restitution? And are we getting a people that are former offenders, those who can be rehabilitated into the workforce as productive law-abiding citizens. Let's hit each of those in turn in in some depth. If you're going to measure something to let taxpayers know whether they're getting their money's worth out of the criminal justice system, what do you measure? Well, certainly you can measure recidivism rates. Mm -hmm. You know, the crime rate, a lot of things affect that demographics, but you can kind of zero in on the recidivism rates, particularly those people that are coming out of prison, those people that are on probation, those people that are on parole, which is supervision after prison. Mm -hmm. And so... Fortunately, we found that there are a lot of things that actually make a positive difference. I mean, drug courts are a great success, Mm -hmm. as well as mental health and veterans courts. In terms of people on supervision, swift and certain sanctions. So in other words, if somebody's missing an appointment, test positive for drugs, you don't wait for these violations to pile up. You say, this weekend, you're going to jail for the weekend. And that has a real impact on behavior. Absolutely. Two-thirds reduction in recidivism. So you can keep your job, keep your family keep your place to live, but you're going to jail this weekend instead of partying. So you've got to measure the right outputs, not necessarily just the inputs. Exactly. And so Governor Reagan, when he was governor of California in the State of the State speech in 1972, he bragged that we had fewer people in prison. More people were being successful on probation and parole than ever before. Fewer people being revoked mm. uh, from supervision. Now, what happened is shortly after that, Jerry Brown became governor, mm. took the rehabilitation out of the mission of the California Department of Corrections, and we had a over a few decades, a six-fold increase in incarceration. An argument is that pendulum needed to swing some because there were people on the left in the 60s saying no one, people aren't responsible, the society is responsible for mm-hmm. crime. They want to mm-hmm. put anybody behind bars. So we needed to have rapists and murderers spend longer periods behind bars, but that pendulum swung too far and we swept in a lot of nonviolent, low-risk offenders. You know, you speak about California. I recently read that Los Angeles County is spending over a quarter million dollars a year to keep each youth offender in jail. And a lot of it has to do with the overhead involved in the pensions for the corrections officers and the rest of that. And it's very difficult to correct something like that because there's such long lead times in making the fixes. What can LA do to get those numbers down? 
Well, actually, interestingly, over the last 15 years, juvenile incarceration has dropped 40% in the United States. At the same time, juvenile crime has plummeted. But the overhead's still there. Oh, sure. It's even more when you have fewer, right? <laughs> right. The programs that really work for kids are those, they're called things like functional family therapy, multisystemic therapy, but what they involve is usually a therapist, a counselor, plus a juvenile probation officer going to that home a few times a week, and usually it's a single mom. Now, she needs help to better supervise her own child. You know, it's no surprise if you have stronger families, mm -hmm. you need a lot less government. Yep. So you build up the capacity of that parent to monitor and control their child, yep. tough love, and then you solve the problem usually. So you mentioned before that crime victims are often left out of the equation. You know, what do you mean by that and, and how do we bring them back in? Well, you know, we've seen cases where literally someone, a property offender, has paid thousands in fines, fees, probation fees, court costs to the government, but the victim still hasn't gotten any restitution. Uh, nationally, only a third of restitution is actually collected. So certainly we know that those people on probation pay 98 times more restitution than those who are incarcerated. Now, of course, there are people that need to be incarcerated. I don't understand what that means. Well, that means when people are in jail or prison, they don't pay any How restitution. They? Right. Yeah, they don't have a job. So part of the probation uh, agreement is that they provide restitution as they go? Yes, it is. Now, we need to get better about enforcing that, like, for example, garnishing from wages, mm -hmm. making it easier to enforce this. And also, the first dollar should go to the victim, not the government. Too often and the money's going to fines and fees to the government. So one of the other things is, particularly with regard to juveniles, like if a kid in your neighborhood mm -hmm. steals from your garage, we can have victim offender mediation where there's a binding agreement that that kid pays you back for what he stole out of his garage. Maybe he should mow your lawn every weekend. That's been done in some places. You know, service restitution as well. Is there a redemptive value to restitution in the mind of the criminal, or is it just viewed as a tax? No, I think it is viewed differently. Uh, I mean... Not, for most, particularly these young offenders, there's usually a conscience that can be awakened. There's a very small number of people who have no conscience. Right. I mean, they're serial killers. They're sociopaths. But usually you can awaken that and you can say, with part of the mediation, is a lot of victims want an apology. Mm. It's not like civil mediation. You go in, it's clear who did the wrong. But a lot of victims want an apology. They also want that offender to say, I won't do it to anybody right, else. Right. And of course, they do want their money back. So maybe they can turn their lives the way former alcoholics do at AA. Yet, yeah, we believe nobody's beyond redemption. We work very closely with Prison Fellowship. They're a partner with us in Right on Crime, and they have amazing programs where volunteers, mentors. You know, now in Kansas, two-thirds of prisoners being discharged, thanks to Governor Brownback, now have a mentor. Most of them are from churches. Interesting. And they meet with them starting before they leave, which makes a huge impact. Sure, there sure there's a relationship. Take a call at two in the morning from you know some guy who says, I might be falling backwards. I need your advice. I want to come back to that later, but I want to circle to the problem as we begin. How did what was once the freest nation on earth end up imprisoning a higher percentage of its citizens than any other country? Well, there's a number of explanations. Certainly, what we've done with regard to drugs, uh, locking up a lot of people mm -hmm. for small amounts of drugs has had a major impact. I think that there was a view a few decades ago that prison was the only thing that worked. And that was before we had electronic monitoring, drug mm. courts. We have now for uh, heroin and other opiates, non-narcotic medications that block the receptors in the mm -hmm. brain. We have more tools. Yeah, actuarial risk and needs assessments where you can assess somebody to a great degree of accuracy, their risk of reoffending. So we do have more tools now. So I think that's helpful. But also, fundamentally, we have to decide as a society, are we about getting even or getting results? Mm. Certainly, the threat to you or I of going to prison would deter us. For somebody <laughs> who's homeless, somebody who's mentally ill, yeah. it doesn't necessarily deter they them. They would almost be better off than being on the street. Well, there are people, there are actually surveys of, of offenders who say they prefer to be in prison than a work release program. Uh, the old adage is three hots on a cot. Yep. Do you see an end to the failed war on drugs anytime soon? Our perspective is that we need to look at how do we divert people, not only from incarceration, but actually from the criminal justice system, people that are possessing small amounts, mm. particularly of marijuana. So one of the examples is the Law Enforcement Assisted Diversion Program, LEAD in Seattle, mm -hmm. which is a combined effort of police and prosecutors, has had tremendous results. But basically, if someone, instead of being arrested and going to jail, they are uh, diverted into treatment, 
and they've been able to get people, most of them are homeless, and they're now in some type of housing. So these people were, you know, inebriated, lying in front of some business or apartment. Mm -hmm. And what the community wanted in downtown Seattle was to have these people off the street. Yeah, and so they is, didn't necessarily want them in jail. But this is the sort of the street wino problem. This is not the, the kid who gets caught with, with, with uh, you know, a little bit of pot and ends up having his life ruined. No, and that's true. Of course, we passed a law in Texas back in 2007 with the Sheriff's Association. It's a cite and summons law. So you can receive a citation for small amounts of marijuana so you're not actually brought to jail. And now the district attorney in Houston, who's a conservative, Devin Anderson, she's gone even further where basically just do eight hours of either drug education or community service and your case is never brought. You have no criminal record. Given the positive experience with marijuana legalization in Colorado, do you think that'll spread? Well, you know, I think it's too early, kind of. There still needs to be some more evaluation of it, but I think that there's still millions of people arrested for small amounts of marijuana and brought to jail. So, I mean, even short of legalizing marijuana, I think what we need to do is say, look at things like the site and summons, because part of the problem we have in this country is pretrial justice, where people languish in jail for weeks or months because they can't afford a small amount of bail. So just going to jail for a week, you lose your job. Yeah, sure. Um, it has ripple effects. Yeah, exactly. So, Mark, along with criminal justice reform, we see a huge increase in criminalization. We had Henry Juskowitz, the CEO of Gibson Guitar, on the show a while back, telling an amazing story of how armed SWAT teams invaded his factory, his guitar factory, dragging him through the most Kafkaesque nightmare over some arcane wood import regulations. How did what started out as an effort to combat trafficking and endangered species evolve into the Spanish Inquisition? Yeah, it's an amazing story, and Henry... Jeskowitz uh, joined us right on crime as the signer of our statement of principles. Mm -hmm. Congress passed the Lacey Act, and what that said was, if you violate the law of another country, it could be a totalitarian regime, right. that that's automatically a crime in the United States, <laughs> which is preposterous. How did that ever happen? As like Nancy Pelosi said, they pass it, then they read it. It's outrageous. So this involved obscure wood in, in Madagascar. Madagascar yeah. And Madagascar, no problem with it, by the way. Yeah. But there was this raid by the Department of Interior on Gibson Guitar. They confiscated all this wood. And what it illustrates is, you know, Gibson Guitar eventually settled. So even, you know, someone with resources up against the full... He fought them for quite a while, and he did get his wood back. Yes. <laughs> but this was outrageous. And so we have over 4,500 federal criminal laws now. And then they gave up counting the Congressional Research Office. Yep. So we need to address this. In Texas, we have 11 felonies relating to harvesting oysters. We have about 2,000 criminal laws, which is similar <laughs> to many other states. We're, we just established a commission to try to roll them back, which I'm on. We're going to make recommendations to legislature about which ones we don't need anymore. But it truly is outrageous because the average American cannot determine what's against the law. Noted civil rights lawyer Harvey Silvergate often warns that if a prosecutor decides to go after you, the average American businessman can be construed to have committed three felonies a day. You know, I thought the Constitution only defined two federal crimes, treason and counterfeiting. What's happened to the federal criminal code? Well, you know, they don't call them lawmakers for no reason. If, if all you have is a hammer, every problem is a nail. And a lot of these criminal laws come about as kind of boutique crimes that are grow from one particular instance. Some of them actually we found at the state level in particular, it's one business trying to put another business out of business yeah. by criminalizing them, that they have to have a certain amount of insurance, a certain license and all of this. So I think that it really is gotten well out of control. And some of these things shouldn't even be matters to be left to the free market, but others should be civil or, you know, an administrative fine. But this idea of attaching a criminal penalty to everything is really problematic. Well, plus federal prosecutors have so much power because once they get going, they could find 16 ways from Tuesday to get you to plea bargain. 97% of the federal cases result in plea bargains. And by the way, one of the interesting things is if you remember like with Arthur Anderson, mm -hmm. you can of course indict a company and when, as soon as they're indicted, even before they're That's convicted, they're debarred, yeah. which means no federal contracting. If you're in healthcare, for example, if you can't be involved with Medicaid or Medicare, right. you're out of business as soon as you're indicted. And Arthur Anderson was eventually vindicated, but didn't do them any good because they were gone. Right. What is mens rea reform and, and why is it stalled in Washington? Well, mens rea reform, what that means is a criminal intent, a guilty state of mind. And so the traditional definition of a crime, going back to Blackstone, the founders of this country, was actus reus, a bad act, plus mens rea, a guilty mind. Now, what we're trying to do at the federal level and what we've been successful in doing in Michigan and Ohio in the last couple of years is passing a default mens rea bill. Unless it's specifically excluded in the legislation. Right. So it says that if a criminal law is silent on the question of whether there's an intent requirement, mm -hmm. this default provision applies. 
One of the best examples is Bobby Unser Jr. He drove his snowmobile during a blizzard into, unbeknownst to him, a federal protected area. You couldn't see the sign because it was obscured by the blizzard. And he's charged with a federal crime. Oh, geez. So what are the politics of mens rea reform in Washington? Who's against it? Well, President Obama <laughs> and a number of liberals in Congress like Patrick Leahy, they view it as coddling big corporations. But the reality is the big companies can hire the fancy lawyers and everything to sort through this labyrinth sure. of federal criminal laws. It's really the little guy that ends up getting hit with this. And But these radical environmentalists, some of them want to put a bunch, they want to put ExxonMobil in federal prison if they sure. could. So that's what we're facing. But I think that the conservatives in the House, Bob Goodlatte, Aaron Hatch in the Senate, they're insisting that mens rea be on the table. So we're hopeful it will go through. Asset forfeiture has become a notorious technique that law enforcement agencies use to fund their police budgets. Remind us of the history of this policy and where you are today in reforming its excesses. Well, what civil asset forfeiture involves, and I, I've distinguished it from criminal forfeiture, which is once you've been convicted, the government can take right, the yeah. fruits of your but crime. But you've had your trial, you've had your day in court. Right. And then also civil asset forfeiture is different from civil asset seizure. Nobody's questioning that if you arrest some drug kingpin, you can immediately take the drugs take the stuff yeah but the question is does title to that property go to the government before you've been convicted of a crime and unfortunately and title of the property could be your car your house right. your boat or just a pile of cash right and so new mexico uh, last year abolished civil asset forfeiture so you retain the title until you're convicted and that's so important because actually the cost of a lot of these cases are you know 1999 chevy the cost of hiring a lawyer when you're never convicted you're exonerated to go get your property back right. why should the burden of proof be on you versus the government when you were exonerated and so this is a completely contrary to our system of justice where you're innocent until proven guilty what made it so popular well, it's a big gravy train for law enforcement and prosecutors. I mean, they have, there's like some training center, like on some hill above Los Angeles, that's yeah. incredible property. And I mean, good. These drug kingpins were convicted and the, they took the money. All we ask is that it be done with due process, that it be consistent with the Constitution. And I don't think it's too much to ask. I read a, an article recently that said that more money was taken from citizens through civil asset forfeiture than was taken by burglars. <laughs> That's true. And again, that's why I don't understand why so many prosecutors and police groups are fighting this, because they'll still get almost all of it. All we're asking is... If they get a conviction. If they get a conviction. So uh, it's not like there's still not going to be a, a lot of uh, proceeds, but as citizens, we need to know it's legitimate. There shouldn't be a profit motive in policing. That's part of it. I believe in capitalism as much as anybody, but in policing, it ought to be about public safety. Let's turn back around to a, an issue you mentioned earlier, which is recidivism and reentry. With so many citizens passing through the prison and then returning to society, what we can do to make sure they don't commit crimes again? That's a great question. Well, I'll tell you, there's so many answers. Perhaps the simplest one is make sure they have a photo ID when they leave. In too many states, they don't even have a photo ID, which is pathetic. Whoa, whoa, whoa. You're kidding. No. So you need, like, you're a non-person when you get out of prison. Exactly. Even for public safety, for getting a job. But I'll tell you, I had the chance to tour prisons in Germany, which was really illuminating. What they do there is I call it the parallel universe model, the idea that the prison should be as much as possible like the real world. And so that has a lot of implications. I don't understand. It means you should work in prison. Prison, right? Do they get paid They're, for yeah, jobs they do. in prison? 16 euros for building bumpers. But they're expected to show up at that job at 8 in the morning. Interesting. So there's a lot of freedom of movement, but a lot of personal responsibility in their prison system. So if you, of course, violate any so it's rules, like a supervised halfway house toward yeah, the end. There's consequences both ways. So you can get incentives, more family visits and things, longer hours. But if you misbehave, there's you have to go to sleep earlier or you, know, you may not get as good of food or whatever it is. So we need to make it just like the real world where good behavior is rewarded, bad behavior is penalized. And what about this ban the box movement that's trying to give uh, returning convictees a chance to get that first job? I think it's fine for government agencies. It's great for them to, to ban the box, but... Explain what that means, please. Well, it means not asking on the initial application whether right. you have a conviction, although it later becomes part of the process of your finalist. But I will think the solution, though, is for the private sector is uh, allowing people to seal their records for most types of offenses after a certain period of time. They're nonviolent there's been no, and there's no recurrence. Yeah, and living in the community for a few years with no new offense and things. So that way, uh, and we have this in Texas, you can get your record sealed. It's an order of non-disclosure. It's still visible to police prosecutors, but you do have a truly a fresh start instead of a scarlet letter for a lifetime. What role should charities, faith-based groups, and community organizations play in helping offenders reintegrate into society? 
Well, that's a great question. I really think we need to utilize... Government just isn't very good at the person-to-person. Think of the Motor Vehicle Bureau. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. So I think the prison wardens need to be incentivized to allow more visits by volunteers, people from prison fellowship. Before release. Right. And then enabling those people to keep in touch as mentors with those inmates afterwards. And certainly faith-based programs no one should be forced, obviously, yeah, constitutionally, sure. but so many inmates are hungering they for that. They need something. They yeah. need some kind of guidance, some kind of roots. Yeah. I mean, and then when you get out, we now have, we brought back our parole chaplains in Texas. They have a list of the churches, synagogues, etc., in the community that are welcoming of parolees. So that parolee can connect with that social group instead of a gang. That's a big difference. So, Mark, how could people learn more about your activities? Well, rightoncrime.com, they can sign up for our email list and and events and such. We're in dozens of states throughout the country. Our main model is we're part of the Texas Public Policy Foundation, which is the free market think tank in Texas, but we work with our counterparts in each of the 50 other states because they've got the connections with legislators in those states. So I just got back from Alaska testifying before the legislature. And so this movement really has started in the states and it's conservative states like Texas, Georgia, Mm -hmm. South Carolina that have led the way. So uh, I encourage folks to join us at rightoncrime.com. Well, Mark, thanks so much for coming on and educating us. We appreciate you coming on the show. Thanks. That was Mark Levin, Policy Director for Right on Crime, as well as the Director of the Center for Effective Justice here on Real Clear Radio Hour, brought to you by the Competitive Enterprise Institute. I'm your host, Bill Frezza. Real Clear Radio Hour is a not-for-profit, donor-supported program produced in conjunction with Real Clear Politics, America's premier independent political website. To make sure you don't miss any of our shows, stop by realclearradio.org and sign up for updates. And if you'd like to support more thoughtful programming like this, please hit the donate button or contact us to become a corporate supporter. Today's program was partially underwritten by the generous support of Old Boston Restorations, a Victorian property management company in Boston South End. Visit them online at oldbostonrestorations.net. That wraps up our show for this week. Please join us next week, same time, same station. See you then.